Hey everyone, I'm Tori. I've got Jake with me here today. We're gonna talk about the sermon from yesterday. So let's unpack that. How are you doing? Great, how are you? I'm good, I have to think about that question for a minute. Okay, um, so I have some really important questions about yesterday's sermon. First of all, did you actually read The Hunger Games or did you have to search that statistic for the quote? I definitely searched the statistic. I have not read one line of The Hunger Games. I really don't know what it's about. I know uh, there were movies made. I know I've never that, seen them. No, not at all. Oh my gosh. Isn't there like a Oh, yeah. Arrow or something? Or? Katniss Everdeen is her name. Yes. Wow. It's If you really want like a dark, uh, it's not apocalyptic, but like post-democracy type thing, it's pretty wild. That is a level of nerdery that I have not <laughs> tapped into yet. So. Shut up. Maybe, maybe, I, should, maybe I should check it out. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> Second question. Uh, was your boot purchase more magical because it happened in Texas? Because... You saw them and you just didn't want to go for it, but then Texas happened and... You know, there is something about downtown Fort Worth, especially for like a native Texan that just brings out the Texan in you. So I think that definitely contributed to the, bur the boot purchase, so. The boot purchase was Texas's fault. Yes, it was Texas's fault. I blame the Republic of Texas with its awesome barbecue and Tex-Mex. Okay, good to know. All right, so one of your points, or the entire point really, of the message was whatever happens, we can stand firm, faithful, and fearless when facing the things we are ill-equipped to handle. Um, do you have any firsthand experience with this or witness of this truth, like in your own life? Mm. <clears throat> so there are things that we feel ill-equipped to handle, like as they're happening to All us. Right. You know, and um, what is there's some fascinating quote from Kierkegaard, and it's this is not like I nerd. I, I read <laughs> <laughs> this is not like I read Kierkegaard with my spare time or anything. <laughs> but he says um, he says something along the lines of um, life has life has to be lived forwards, but it happens backwards or something like that. Oh. I'm not getting it right. Um, it essentially communicates that hindsight's kind of twenty twenty, right? Yeah. And so when things happen to you that you feel ill-equipped with, you can look back on them and recognize uh, the providential hand of God kind yeah. of leading you through specific things. I know that was um, the case when uh, my dad, my own dad, was in his final days. Yeah. And there was just a peace and assurance that I felt being beside him on his hospital bed and holding wow. his hand and getting to experience that. And it was very weighty. Yeah. And that's probably just a, a big leap into no, the, the um, deep end. But um, situations like that, that definitely at the time I felt ill-equipped to handle, but maintaining the consistency that I could stand firm, faithful, and fearless mm -hmm. uh, when it came to the gospel, knowing that um, my dad's eternity was secure yeah. in Christ. Yeah. Uh, that, that's just the overwhelming comfort that's present in a moment like that. That makes me think too, you talked a little bit about suffering, um, and I, I, I'm not gonna quote it, I don't know if it was a quote, but the idea has kind of, entered into my life where it's um, so God will give us the grace that we need when we need it and sometimes and I do this I feel like we try to and this is gonna be a weird phrase we try to hoard grace and store it up before it's time and, and what I mean mm -hmm. is make sure that we're prepared for every bit of suffering every element so like for example I'll hear stories about people going through certain types of suffering and I'm like, okay, God, I, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for that, I can't do it. And um, sometimes we create anxiety because we're trying to be ready for it, I guess. Um, but just knowing that like God's grace was with you in the amount that you needed, when yeah. you needed it. And so- um, Encouraging. Even, Yeah, that makes me think. Just yesterday, um, after the message was finished, uh, you know, we go over and stand mm -hmm. um, to the side while you guys finish up the worship set. And 
we had a church member that recently lost her husband mm -hmm. and she was there yesterday yeah. and my eyes were kind of fixed on her yeah. and as she was singing um, the chorus of the goodness of God oh my gosh. with just tears in her eyes knowing full well what she is currently enduring oh my I just lost it yeah but that is kind of what we're talking about um, in a moment like that, in a season that this woman finds herself in, right. she can consistently remind herself of the goodness of God, even in the midst of the most devastating loss of her life. Yeah. And that amount of suffering is something that every person in Christ's church right. has tapped into. Yeah. There's some degree or some level of suffering that another person has experienced yeah. that is going to be beneficial to another person that hasn't yet. And I think that's one of the beautiful things of the church that really is unifying to it, which is exactly what Paul is talking about in Philippians. Right. Not that not only that there's joy in the midst of suffering, but right. that there's also unity in it too. Yeah. And that is just an overwhelming or overarching theme throughout the book of Philippians that we're gonna see as we continue to make our way through this message series together. It's so timely too. I, I just find myself um, I guess it's called doom scrolling on yeah. Instagram. <laughs> It's horrible, and I, I just need the Lord's help. But just having Paul's words and having Christ's Spirit be just present enough to say, "Hey, you don't, you don't need to do that. You don't have to doom scroll, and you don't have to, I guess, try and, and gather up all of the spiritual information you need all at mm -hmm. once." It's, it's that Christ is present and His Spirit is present, um, and it's just really sweet. The, the church is such a gift to oh, yeah. the individual believer. Um, yeah, and that's, that's the whole purpose of Philippians too because he is writing this letter to give back to Epaphroditus so that he can deliver it back to the church in Philippi. Like I mentioned yesterday, okay. it's over 800 miles away. That's wild, to, by the way. Yeah. That's wild. And you, you think about like, that's just like weather permitting and uh, right. elements permitting and how they traveled mm -hmm. and the places he would have to dock at and everything. Yeah. The, the horrible conditions surrounding that 800 mile trip, but he makes it back to deliver this letter to the church at Philippi that's not only encouraging to them, but is also um, a letter of thanks for everything that they've given Paul to ensure that his ministry mm -hmm. is successful and that he has what he needs to continue to fulfill um, his his journey and his his I guess obligation to right. continue to promote um, the message of the gospel throughout um, ancient Europe. So um, I want to change gears a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that stood out was you mentioned Paul's age when mm. he was writing the letter. Um, to the people at Philippi, it's really sobering to stop and recognize that obedience to Christ doesn't have really qualifications. Like you don't have to be some biblical scholar oh, yeah. or a certain age. It's always going to hurt or mm. cause sacrifice. And it's not really a question, but do you find, what do you find are the hindrances, I guess, to immediate obedience. Like there's there's stories throughout scripture where the Lord said something and people just did it. Like Abraham, mm. or Abram at the time, he was like, go and I'll tell you where you're going later. He's like, okay. And it's like, I don't, I don't know what keeps us sometimes from having that kind of obedience or that kind yeah. of turnaround, you know? <clears throat> yeah, there's such a there's, there's such a great deal of reluctance when it comes to things like that, especially um, in the current culture that yeah. that we live in, there's there's this there's just this this standstill yeah. um, because we we don't have uh, the resources at our fingertips, or we we try to convince ourselves that mm, 
this probably isn't not uh, what I'm supposed the, to do. Actually. The spirit yeah. actually leading me to do anything. Yeah. But what we fail to realize is that if it's actually consistent with the character of the God that we worship throughout the pages of Scripture, then it absolutely is something that He is prompting us to do. Yeah. And we need to follow through with obedience as quickly as possible because, I don't know if this has been your experience, but with mine, it just kind of lingers. It does. It eats you alive until you, know you it's obey. Something <laughs> that you, you know it's something that you're, you're supposed to do. Yeah even if it's completely weird and out of the norm right. because most of the time it's going to be that. It is. <laughs> it is. And you're like, God wouldn't be telling me to do something like this. It's too weird. You know where I find it most frequently <laughs> is in relationships and friendships. Like when I, and this is going to sound small, but when I either have an issue with someone or I feel like someone has an issue with me, it's like, and I know I need to address it so that there's nothing in the air. Yeah. It will eat at me until, like I can shove it away maybe for a little bit, but yeah. oh my gosh, it just eats at me. And I feel like there's been years of my life where I will go through and just let that eat at me. And then I, I'm like, I start getting, you know, clinically depressed yeah. over here. Like, I'll, you know, I'll just, oh, I'm so upset. And then the Lord will bring back to me, hey, do you remember that thing I told you to address? Mm. And I'm like, no. And he's like, you need to address it. And it's almost as if the moment those things are addressed, you know, conflict or whatever, there's just a relief almost physically mm -hmm. and spiritually. And I was about to say <gasps> there's like an overwhelming just sigh. Yes. That's like yes. this sweet relief of something that you yeah. should have taken care of Ugh. maybe even years prior. Yeah. And now that it's finally done, not only do you realize that it wasn't that big of a deal, but you realize God has consistently been faithful to lead me in such a way to where he's been patient with me, yeah. but at the same time, he's a loving father and he wants me to be, um, continually transformate tra transformated yeah transformated <laughs> hey we just made up a word he, he wants me to be continually transformed yeah. into the likeness of Christ yeah and so that's something that uh, he's patient with us to do right man yeah he's so good for it absolutely okay so last thing is there anything that you wanted to add yesterday that you feel like you didn't have time for or that you forgot or any anecdote or any just last little tidbit of information you'd like to leave us with? You know, I think we actually already covered what I wanted to emphasize a little bit more mm -hmm. and that was kind of the suffering component yeah. because that's something we are so uncomfortable with. Yes. Um, and when, when those seasons of suffering come in our lives, they just hit, hit us like a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. And so we're so emotionally devastated by these moments that we often forget that this is something that is meant to draw us into further uh, relationship and right. communion with the Lord. Right. And that's, again, I, I come back to everything that Paul is currently enduring is in his imprisonment. You know, it's really yeah. interesting. I actually stood inside of the Mamertine prison in Rome, which was not during this imprisonment, but was Paul's final imprisonment in wow. Rome, right before he was about to be executed. And to stand in that room is, is very, very sobering, wow. because you realize how small it is, how cold and damp and dark, and you, you think about the surroundings that Paul often find, uh, found himself in, mm. And it's just another indicator like, yeah, even though I'm so far removed from uh, the specific circumstances that a person like Paul endured, um, I can still, in the midst of how difficulty and trouble manifests itself in my time, mm -hmm. I, I can still make my way towards being comfortable with the suffering that is going yeah. to be characteristic in my life sometimes. Yeah. And that's a really, like I mentioned yesterday, that's a really hard pill for us to swallow right. because we are, we are trained to avoid it at all costs. For avoidance, yeah. for instant gratification, right. to flee from anything that's hard. Right. Um, and just to, just to surround ourselves with 
or immerse ourselves in things that remove our attention from things like that. Yeah. Which is why I pointed out things like, man, from November 1st to December 31st of last year, people spent $222 billion Wild. online alone. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're just after the things that, or the, the Dyson Airwrap. <laughs> you know, the fact that that's $500. Oh my gosh. And that was the top of so many teenagers' Christmas lists this yeah. past year, and it was given to them. Yeah. And so, um, I would I would have definitely emphasized a little bit more of the suffering component, and probably fleshed out a, a few more ways that we can deal with those things as they come at us. Yeah. And maybe we'll have time to emphasize those a little bit more as we continue to make our way through the the series in Philippians throughout January. Very cool. Well, thanks for joining us, Jake. Thanks, it was Tori. A pleasure. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on Let's Unpack That.